welcome everyone. Uh, this is the third instalment, I think, in this uh, CSOX seminar series on Southeast European realities amid uh, Europe's multiple crises. Uh, my name's Alice Block. I'm doing a DPhil in social policy. Um, I'm in the early stages of looking at youth policy in Bosnia and Kosovo. Um, and I'll be chairing this event, which today is focused on alternative religious responses to the ethnic crisis in Bosnia-Herzegovina, faith-based peace and reconciliation. Um, our speaker today is Dr. Julianne Funk, uh, a peace scholar and practitioner who works on the Western Balkans, uh, focused on Bosnia. Uh, Julianne teaches in political science and religious studies at the University of Zurich and also works for local NGOs in the region. Um, in fact, Julianne, if I'm correct, is currently heading or coordinating a project called Trauma, Memory and Healing in the Balkans and Beyond for the TPO Foundation, which is based in Sarajevo. Uh, her recent research and publications are on the themes of lived religion, uh, Bosnian Islam, sujivot, or coexistence, uh, trauma, and healing. Um, so how things will work, Julianne's going to speak probably for about 45 minutes, maybe 50, and then we'll go to Adis Merzanovic, who will be our discussant, uh, reflecting on the, the presentation that Julianne gives. Um, as many of you, I'm sure, know, uh, Addis is a junior research fellow here at CSOX. Uh, his work focuses on constitutional order in divided post-conflict societies uh, from the viewpoint of political theory, mainly. Um, in particular, he's interested in consociational democracy, which, as I'm sure most of you know, is the, the form of, of democracy in, in uh, post-Dayton Bosnia. And it's also the subject of his new book, Democracy by Decree. Um, at the moment, Addis is uh, working on a project dedicated to the challenges of liberalism in the Western Balkans and the region's European perspective. Um, and this is funded by, quite a mouthful, uh, the Swiss National Science Foundation's Early Postdoc Mobility Programme. Uh, so we'll hear from Addis later. He'll probably talk for about 10 minutes after Julianne's presentation. And uh, I'd ask you to keep questions until the end, unless if I understand, unless they're kind of, you know, points of clarification or that kind of thing. Um, but I'll hand over to you, Julia. Thank you. Thank you. It's very much an honor to be here. I never expected to be speaking at Oxford, so thank you very much. I was sitting in this part of the, of the room once upon a time, actually when I met Adis years ago, which is sort of a funny comeback round. I wanted to start with something I do in my class, but I've been warned I shouldn't. So um, <laughs> I'm an American. So we have different teaching techniques, and I know I'm not teaching in here, but I usually find that when I, so, so I'm not going to do it, but I'm going to do sort of an, an other version to start off with. I find that if I don't know my audience, it can, I've had one kind of not so good experience with an audience I didn't know very well, and it's very hard to speak to an audience you don't know. So if I may, if you will indulge me, a half American approach to getting to know you, I won't make you stand up and do what I would normally do. Um, <laughs> But I want to ask you if, just to raise your hand, if what I say applies to you, if you agree with what I say, and if you don't, keep your hand down. It just tells me a little bit about who you are, so that I hope I can speak to you a little bit better. So here's a few statements. Normally, it's a barometer, and I have all my students stand up, and I, I make a statement. And if you agree, you go to one end. If you really strongly agree, you go to one end of the room. You really strongly disagree, you go to the other end. And of course, there's lots of people in the middle, and then they can say why, and blah, blah, blah. But don't worry, stay seated. <laughs> so the first question, or the first statement, sorry, is I have a background in conflict and peace studies, or and I've been engaged in conflict resolution or conflict transformation. If that applies to you, if you would raise your hand. I know you, we can't do the barometer now because we can't say what kind of, thank you. I have been regularly engaged in politics or political sciences. Thank you. I have been regularly engaged in social services. That's an American word. I don't know if that makes sense here. So, or, or the social sciences. So social services might be, in my case, for example, working with refugees, um, the homeless, things that, that address social and welfare issues. So I've been active regularly in that, okay. I've been regularly engaged with one or more religions or the study of religions. Thank you. Can we put a hand half up? Yeah, <laughs> exactly. You'd be in the middle, right, of my barometer, but yeah. Thank you. Um, I'm familiar with Islam as a religion or with Muslims. Mm -hmm. And I'm familiar with the situation in Bosnia and Herzegovina. 
Okay. <laughs> so that's the majority. Sure that. Okay, that helps me very much. Thank you for engage, for uh, engaging a little bit in that. With my class, I teach on religion and conflict, and it's always interesting to me with my class, my students, to see where they fall. I didn't ask you about secularization. That's one I wanted to, but see where people fall on how they view different issues. I am going to speak from a paper that I am in the middle of finishing up for publication, um, co-authored with Zilka Spahic Siljak, um, an, a Bosnian woman who's writing on mostly on, on women's issues, on Islam, and some now more and more on peace and conflict. So she's co-authoring this. It's not just my words. And I'm going to pull pieces from it because um, it really addresses the topic. <coughs> Alternative Religious Responses to the Ethnic Crisis in Bosnia and Herzegovina. I work very much anthropologically, or I think of myself as working anthropologically when I do research. I try to meet people and get to know them very well. I do participant observation. So that's, I work at the grassroots. That's the orientation um, of this paper or this presentation, which is exploring uh, the role of religious actors in peace building and their struggle to challenge the imposed ethnic and religious divisions in the post-war situation of secular Bosnian society. This is done in a post-war context in which religions, as you will know if you know Bosnia, were the prime ethnic contents distinguishing the three warring parties and were used to divide usually rather than reconcile. So the context of religion is not a peace factor. In fact, I remember once upon a time when I was starting my doctoral research, my translator at that time said, how can you talk about religion and peace? Religion's what divides us. So that poses the problem, right? How can we even talk about this? Um, I will get to that. Currently, the conflict continues, as you may know, pursued now through politics, where Serbian Orthodoxy, Croat Catholicism, and Bosniak or Bosnian Islam are intertwined with their nation's legitimacy. In the post-communist context, the religious communities have experienced not only a resurgence of collective belonging, but also of personal devotion. So we have different experiences of religion. It's not just that people who are religious are aligning themselves with nations. There's also a revival. People talk about a revival of religiosity. I'm not going to speak of authentic faith. That's another topic that I don't really want to get into. In this environment where religious religion colors the ethnic tense of the nations, if we think about Volkan's work on ethnic identity, a small and relatively invisible number of faith-based peace builders are doing their best to counteract this, dy this dynamic of ethnic cleansing, trying to bridge the now segregated communities and address the distrust, prejudice, suffering, and trauma. Some of the most visible and active religious peace builders are Muslims. Therefore, that's going to be my focus in this paper. I'm happy to take questions about Christians, but most of my work has been with Muslims. <coughs> um, I'm going to look at the role of Islam or of their Muslim faith in their efforts as, as a personal faith that both inspires, so looking at uh, faith as motivation or vocation, but also as a key component in their activities. So religious peace builders would, would not only be people who, who say that they're building peace because they're Muslims in this case, but also they're incorporating their faith actively and religious identity actively into their work, which is a unique thing in Bosnia. And I'm going to use four case studies, four people. Um, Amra Panjo from Sarajevo, Sabiha Husic from Zanitsa, and then Vahidin Omanovic and Mevludin Rahmanovic, who are both from Sanski Most, which is uh, in the northwestern part of Bosnia, who I selected due to their exceptional and recognized peace building initiatives, but especially because of this active um, engagement of their faith. So they explicitly draw from their Islamic faith. This quality is rare in Bosnia and Herzegovina, making these four case studies quite unique. All were young people during the war and based their work on experiences of conflict and violence at home, personal experiences. Each works primarily locally in his or her municipality, but they each are also engaged regionally and internationally. None of them represents the Islamic community as such, except as members of, the, of their communities. So first, the term peace building. 
encompasses many and various efforts which combined seek to build a sustainable and positive peace, to use Galtung's term of what is being sought. Bosnia has witnessed many initiatives, if you know Bosnia, I'll skip over that, of um, now known as peace building, from refugee returns to structural reforms. Um, while all of these sought to provide support to Bosnia and Herzegovina, not all succeeded, which we would know, I suppose, if those of us know what's going on in Bosnia. Due to a plethora of challenges, one being the devastation of trust, which allows for social cohesion and cooperation between the ethnic groups or the former warring parties, as well as the society's will to rebuild the relationships between ethnicities. So trust is a really important component of what I'm looking at. And this is the area in which these religious peace builders are working, trying to rebuild trust such that relationships can be rebuilt. Religious peace building, so that's another term, which you may or may not have heard, is coming from a really a young, a young sub-discipline of peace and conflict studies. If you may have heard of R. Scott Appleby, he wrote what is now becoming a classic, if you can call anything classic in a young discipline, classic book called The Ambivalence of the Sacred, I highly recommend that, um, where he defines religious peace building as the various phases, levels, and types of activity, which may sound resonant of peace building generally, by religious actors and others that strengthen religion's role in creating tolerant and nonviolent societies, including not only conflict transformation on the ground and post-conflict structural reform, which is what we usually associate with peace building, but also the efforts of people working at a remove from actual sites of deadly conflict, such as legal advocates of religious human rights, scholars conducting research, like myself, relevant to cross-cultural and interreligious religious dialogue, theologians and ethicists who are probing and strengthening their religious communities' traditions of nonviolent militants. And he's making a differentiation between two different kinds of militants, religious extremists and nonviolent religious militants. And he says they're both authentic relationships to the sacred, but one is, as he puts it, giving in to the, temp the irresistible temptation of violence as a method, whereas the nonviolent activists are not. So to tell you, that's, that's sort of an introduction. I want to speak a little bit about the context that I'm talking about. So looking at what is, what is the role of religion in, in the society of Bosnia, which I'll try to keep short since I think you are more familiar with that. How did religious peace building develop in Bosnia? And then these four case studies. Um, in brief, let me see here. So the context. Um, I didn't ask about secularization, but uh, Jose Casanova has three definitions of, of secularization, which I think are helpful in looking at has Bosnia secularized or desecularized, or both. So during communism, we see this secularization through these three different components of of what we can look at as secularization. So there's the differentiation of state and religion, which is what I think most of us, or at least most of my students in Switzerland, think of when we think of secularization. But there's also the elements of um, the marginalization of religion into the private life and the decline of religiosity, which are all elements that we think of, or some people think of, with secularization. And these all more or less happened during the communist period. The differentiation of the state and religions. The decline of religiosity certainly happened. You have this the Yugoslav identity coming out also. Um, and the marginalization of religion into cultural and traditional practices. Um, in Yugoslavia, it's important to note that religion did not disappear, but instead retreated from the view of the official socialist state. It was practiced more as cultural tradition and folklore, which was not considered a threat to the socialist regime because they didn't, these traditions didn't necessarily question, um, didn't necessarily become nationalists. So they actually sometimes bridged. I think this is a very interesting phenomenon if you've run across it in Bosnia or the region, where, for example, Komšiluk was a tradition that may or may not be viewed as religious because religion, again, was a cultural phenomenon during this time, which actually bridged different communities uh, religious communities. So you had the phenomenon of people celebrating each other's religious holidays, which doesn't happen much anymore in Bosnia. So for Christmas, um, let's say it was Catholic Christmas, the, the Catholic family would make perhaps um, 
a halal cake as well for the Muslim visitors, neighbors who would come um, to celebrate, to congratulate them on Christmas. So this is the way that religion was looking during the communist time, quite secularized, you could say. With the breakup of Yugoslavia and the end of communism, the entire Balkan region experienced, I don't know if we should call it desecularization, but certainly an increase in religion's place in society, which I think we can all note. Um, alongside the reaffirmation of ethno-national identity and modern democratization. The vast majority of residents today, I am constantly told 80%, uh, associate themselves with religion or claim faith, while churches and mosques see much higher attendance than during communism. Powerful ethno-national and ethno-religious elites enabled religious communities to play important roles. And here's a, a good quote from Ognjanovic, yeah, Ognjanovic and Jozelic. Relig religious organizations had put on political hats. I think that's a useful analogy. And they took over important roles of influence in society on many different levels as moral guards of the nations, each religion for its own, as educators by becoming part of the regular schooling, so religion is taught in public schools, and as a mobilizing agency for all the different kinds of political goals one can have in, in, a, in a post, in, in the ex-Yugoslavia um, territory. So religion is playing a lot of different roles in, a pu in the public sphere. At, although today the Bosnian state is considered secular, with civic legislation accompanied by a set of international human rights norms and standards, the revived religious heritage now enjoys prestige and protection under democratic rule, which I find a really, is a really interesting paradox. This experiment continues to provoke a heated debate due to its divisive character among the already divided society and remains one of the <coughs> arguments again, for religion to be again privatized or made marginal. So that's a bit the context. What about religious peace building? Where did this come from? So you may remember that peace building, if, you, if you're familiar with conflict and peace studies, peace building didn't exist until the Bosnian War. Peace building was defined by Butros Butros Ghali, UN Secretary General in 1992, with his agenda for peace, where he talked about, in the most general terms at the very beginning, about peace building. So there was no such thing as religious peace building, certainly before peace building. And that was coming about in, through the Bosnian War. So the first efforts that were happening for peace building in Bosnia were mostly what my colleague Zilka, who wrote this with me, she called them human rights efforts. They weren't peace building, they were human rights efforts. Um, and maybe you would call them relief as well, efforts. So the people who I'm looking at in my cases were peace builders, not religious peace builders at the very beginning. They were learning secular peace building methods as a brand new field of, of work, actually. The f one of them, so I will show you already some pictures of, these are the four that I will focus on. Amra Panjo in the left, Sabiha Hujic on the right, and the Mevludin of Vahidin down at the bottom. Amra was remembering those early years when peace activists were pioneers. She says, we were experimenting with approaches in response to the ever-present suffering, war trauma, the psychological and emotional devastation. We had no methodology or expertise. Simply, they were responding. Um, and Vahidin spoke about how we didn't have a clear model, but we knew what our goal was. So everything was being developed at this time. It was all brand new. Peace building and human rights activism during the first five post-war years, so pre-2000, in Bosnia were not motivated by nor engaged religion. Instead, secular human rights organizations gathered people who generally did not strongly identify with ethno-nationalist politics or religion, so quite the opposite because of the role of religion in the ethno-nationalist partisanship. So actually, most of the peace building was, was being sought to be very, very secular. The international community and donors simply ignored religious communities and faith-based organizations when supporting democratization projects. Amra, again, explaining, the civil sector was separated from anything that was this ethno-national mainstream. In other words, these were the organizations that mostly inherited some of the socialist and communist and atheist ideas. Everything related to nationalism or, God forbid, religiosity was removed from civil society. So you can imagine that this is not a very friendly atmosphere for religious peace building. In addition to this issue of not wanting to bring religion into peace building because of the ethno-national factor, 
There is the other challenge to religious peace building that the religious communities are not teaching peace at all. This is not coming from the religious communities. The Islamic community, for example, still has no program or department on peacemaking, nor has it trained its imams or teachers in this field whatsoever. And we can speculate, we can all speculate about why, but there seems to be a general disinterest in that. For the Serbian Orthodox peace builders, their church provides an additional obstacle um, by requiring a special blessing from the religious authorities. So if you're a peace builder and you want to say that I'm a Serbian Orthodox peace builder, I'm doing this in the name of my faith, you have to get this blessing from your church. And for reconciliation efforts, that's not so easy because the church is not, that's not the agenda of the, of the Orthodox church, just as it's probably not the agenda of the Islamic community. So it's almost impossible. And so I actually found very, very few. I found one who I ended up writing in my dissertation as the epilogue because I only found him after I did all of my research in, <laughs> in Zhito Mislic and doing, doing this kind of work. Um, but the decentralized nature of the Islamic community at, allows Muslim peace builders to be sort of free agents. I look at them as sort of free agents. They're not being either endorsed by their community nor hindered. They're just sort of left alone to do their work, which if you compare it with the Orthodox Church, I guess is, okay, is better than, um, than being hindered, but certainly is not being supported. Amra Panjo, for example, started off her work with funding from the Mennonites, from Christians, and most of her work is being funded by Christians, which she thinks is highly ironic. That's kind of funny. So despite this very unfertile ground, faith-based peace building developed from these roots. Five years after the conflict, from 2000 onwards, there was a definite shift in capacity and vision for peace work generally. Some Muslim peace builders contributed to dialogue and reconciliation through individual civil society initiatives or as imams in their own mosques. Others took first steps and joined secular civic society organizations, so um, like Amra, for example. While some secular organizations actually um, held out their hands to religious actors. For example, in Sabih Hohusic's case, there were some German activists coming in wanting to do work on trauma, and they realized that engaging women, well, that they were doing women's work, work with women, that engaging religious actors would actually benefit their work. It would be um, added sensitivity. So they asked her and, and my co-author to help them with that. So it's quite practical, actually, at this point. In the beginning of faith being recognized as a missing element in the peace-building process and acceptance that religious voices should be heard, came with the establishment of Bosnia's Interreligious Council, which you may have heard about in 1997, and its pressure on international funders. The international community and donors seemed to have realized that religious actors could play a role in peace and reconciliation, but also that the exclusion of faith-based activists in favor of secular ones produced additional problems, additional polarization, mistrust, and divisions. Another element in developing religious peace building was um, raising awareness among believers that they also belong to civil society and can contribute to this act activism. For many people in Bosnia, including peace builders, the idea of bringing faith and the work of relational reconciliation together is unprecedented. You could say shocking for many people. The idea of bringing these two together, you would have, let's say, a believer and a peace builder. You would have, I mean, plenty of my friends who are believers and peace builders who, who would never combine those aspects in their work. That's simply not done. So this is really quite um, a, special, a special thing. With a few rare exceptions, religious peace building in Bosnia was therefore initiated within, as I said, secular international organizations who were involved in training the locals in the activism rather than the re religious institutions. And then, well, as we'll, I'll talk about with these particular examples, the actual activists are bringing in their faith practices and their faith perspectives as their own kind of negotiation with their peace building. So let's talk about these actual actors. And I want to look at these, I call them Bosnian Muslim peace builders or Muslim peace builders in Bosnia, um, through how this began, how they first brought these two qualities together. What is, how is this their vocation? And then how, what are the methods that they use that are particular to religious peace building? So this is a bit some stories for you. And I'm trying to remember what my next slide is. Yeah, we'll get to that. So the initiation, how these come together. <coughs> Vahidin, we'll start with Vahidin. Vahidin studied to be an imam even before the war began. 
His life as a peace builder, however, began after the war in a dialogue workshop he attended against his will. He was full of anger, fear, and a strong desire for revenge against Serbs. And he, he had to go because he was teaching in a school and the principal said, all of our teachers have to go to this if you want to remain a teacher at the school. Probably some outside donor-initiated scheme. But anyway, he was forced to go. And the American NGO trainer who was training at this workshop said something that stuck with him. She said, either this generation will deal with the burden of its suffering or it will leave it behind to the next generation. She referred to the situation in Israel where Israeli traumas from the Holocaust are lived out in the current generation against the Palestinians. And this really shook Vahidin to the core. He couldn't bear the idea of leaving this legacy of his own, the anger he was carrying, leaving that to his child. Nor could he consider the idea that his own people who suffered so much could actually have the capacity to turn around and do the same thing. So he really, at that point, it was really a turning point for him and his transformed vision um, and the continued work with this organization that was training brought him back to life, he says, enabling him to again trust people and believe again in humanity. Like the other examples here, he trained further in peace building. He did an MA in the US in the same field. But even prior to the moment, this moment of catharsis, he said he recognized that Islam was about peace, big, peace building and it was not a nonviolent communication. However, he said it was actually meeting Serbs who were sorry for what happened in this particular dialogue that helped me starting to start to live true Islam. Those are his words. Years of studying Islam and Muhammad's life brought him then later to a personal understanding of as he understands Muhammad's mission for peace, which allowed him to first connect and later to truly integrate these two parts of him, his work and his life. Mavludin has a similar story. Mavludin came to this practice through Vahidin. He's also an imam. He is a bit younger, five years younger, and when he was, he was quite small when the war began, and he watched what was happening. He was living in Priador, or near Priador at that time. Uh, for example, a close family friend and their next door neighbor became a police chief and was the one directing the execution of his people from his village and his family members. And he said, at that point, I lost everything, my faith, my trust, everything. He was angry um, on the one hand, but he also realized that taking revenge was not the act of a true Muslim. He met Vahidin and then learned through Vahidin's um, initiatives that one can, Vahidin was seeking to reconcile as an act of faith. And that wasn't really enough for Mevludin, but he, from that point, started himself to do research into Islam and to see, for example, he, he mentioned in the Quran it says that you have the right to defend yourself, to fight back, but it's always better to forgive. That the right, that the better path is to, is to pursue peace. Amra was also engaged in peace building during the war. She comes from a communist background, not a religious background. Um, and she was introduced, as I think I mentioned, to faith-based peace building by Mennonites who have long been doing this um, incorporation. So Mennonites are a Christian uh, um, denomination, one of the historic peace churches. And so she learned actually to bring her faith into her peace building through Christians. Realizing that she could pursue her Muslim faith and her peace activism in sync, but also that the combination was more than its parts, she really started to dig into this. And she's very active with this now. She has her own NGO called Small Steps, um, and she, that's where she's doing most of her activism. She has her own full-time job on the side to, to have income, and she does this completely as a volunteer. Um, I'm going to skip Sabiha because I want to keep moving along. Peace building as a vocation. How is, this, how is this faith actually the motivation for the peace work? Because plenty of of peace builders and activists in Bosnia are believers who don't combine those. How, what, what is that um, combination? Amr calls her Muslim faith her deep motivation and strength, her conviction and the reason for her peace activism. She says, I seriously consider this path, I con seriously consider this the path to be saved. Such an orientation to peace work can be called vocation or a sense of purpose and a sacred duty. Um, Sabiha remembers how her parents taught her to greet her fellow Muslims with words of peace when she was a child. 
Her guiding principle is that genuine progress can be seen only when we find peace within ourselves, understand its beauty, and feel the desire to contribute to peace in everyday life. She says, as a European Muslim woman, I find this peace through my faith. This is very Bosnian. You wouldn't find this in other contexts, I suppose. Um, she says her experience of Islam is empowering and comforting, giving her purpose, productivity, and happiness. And she rejects the patriarchal interpretations of religion or the idea that Islam does not uphold human rights. For, for Sabiha, Islam helps her to be a better person and a more accountable citizen. And Mavludin and Vahidin talk about Islam as, as the main source or the engine of their work. So that shows a little bit about how that functions within their own psyches. So what about the actual methods? So this looks like a big long list, and I apologize for that. The Tannenbaum Center for Interreligious, I think it's dialogue, um, has made this list, well, I've summarized it. They have a book called Peacemakers in Action, where they, at the, in the introduction, talk about these different techniques. And I've used them in my dissertation, and I'm bringing them here as just some different methods that are being used. And I won't go through all of them with examples, although I have it in my paper, but just to read through some of them that are specific to religious peace building that you won't find necessarily in other. So incorporating religious texts into peace work, preaching or public instruction, they call it the power of the pulpit, so really speaking peace from the pulpit. <clears throat> using and adapting religious and cultural rituals, so already existing cultural. Remember I said that it, religion in, in Bosnia was, is really became more of a cultural aspect rather than so much religion. So using these religious practices, these cultural practices and traditional ways and incorporating religion into it. The fourth one is really interreligious dialogue, using religion in discussion and debate and finding common ground. Peace education as a foundation for this transformation. Religious, that can happen, of course, not necessarily just with religious peace building, but this is focused on looking at, with, at building peace within and between religious communities. Just communication skills, so for example, publications. Creating philosophies of nonviolence and zones of peace. Interfaith mobilization. Awakening the global community, and that could be done through, like, the global Ummah or the Catholic, greater Catholic Church, but it can also be um, done in other ways. And then also, this is very important for, for Bosnia, as I've been saying, adapting secular and Western peacebuilding practices to religious peacebuilding, which is what all of these people did. So let me give you a couple examples of, of, of a couple of these. So, for example, the first one. In Amra's peacebuilding workshops, she often communicates her main point through a religious story or teaching and finds that Christian, Muslim, or Jewish participants tend to be amazed to see how the secular peace objectives cooperate so well with religious ideas. She observes how this connects something inside themselves. For example, with a group that has already become well acquainted, so this is after she's done work with a group and they're a mixed group, ethnically mixed or religiously mixed group, and they feel comfortable with each other and they feel safe, she says, this is one exercise she does. One participant is requested to look another in the eyes and, and ask them to change yourself. The invitation or the command, depending on how it's received, depending on how it's given, um, to this action of change yourself is direct and very provocative. Inevitably, so the response, the person who's being addressed is allowed to say one sentence in reply. And there's a lot of responses she says like, what? Or why should I do that? Or you do that? But it's essentially a call to reflect upon the deepest parts of ourselves that are usually hidden and that are vulnerable. To move from a passive to an active role in one's own <coughs> life challenges, to change oneself, not the outside context. And reflecting upon the exercise with her group after, so she does this exercise, and then she has during her evaluation time, this is her adaptation, sorry, last one. This is also how she adapts. This is all sec a secular peace building exercise. But then she adapts it during the evaluation at the end, the reflecting back upon what, what did we learn. In reflecting upon this during the time, she, she refers to the exhortations of the prophets in all religions who push people to examine themselves and turn to follow a better path. 
And my observation, according to the religion of sujivot, or mutual life, this ability to cross these different religious boundaries as, as kind of a mutual space of resources, she uses not only Muslim prophets, but also, for example, in this case, she referred to me to using the prophet Jonah, which is in, in Judaism and in Christianity in the Bible. Jonah didn't want to change. God called him to go and speak to Nineveh, the godless city of Nineveh, and tell them to repent of their godless ways. And Jonah said, no, I don't want to do that. They're horrible people. So he ran away from God, and he went on a ship, and he fell, and he was tossed into the water, and he was swallowed by a fish, and it only took, it took all of this for him to repent. So the lesson being, change yourself. You can do that now, or do you want to keep running away? So she uses this example from the prophets and how that finally Jonah changes, okay, God, I go now and talk to the city of Nineveh. And Nineveh repented and he was angry again. <laughs> said, but they're horrible and godless. Anyway, that's an interesting story. So that's one way she incorporates faith into this. In this example here, um, Amra is here, and you can only see the back of her, next to Anna Rafai, and the two of them are teaching together. Anna Rafai is a Croat Catholic. Um, and they're teaching together a mixed group here in Visoko. I was with them a couple of years back. Um, where it's really an interreligious um, engagement. And I didn't put the picture up here, but I'll tell you about another exercise, which is lovely. Where you have a, a group of these women, you, you put out carpets. Let's say, you know, the size of this table, or half the size, let's say this table. And you put as many women as you can get to fit on this, in this group, to stand on this carpet. And the goal of the exercise is to turn the carpet over, but nobody can step on the floor. So the pictures are lovely. They're all, you know, trying to get... So, of course, this requires touching each other. This requires becoming a bit intimate, actually, and turning this carpet over while standing upon it. And it's, for me, a lovely vision of the capacity to negotiate in places when we have to. And this is only for women? This particular one was only for women, yeah. But Amr does exercises with youth, with mixed groups, all sorts. This one was particularly for women. Actually organized by, so the leaders are a Croat Catholic and a Muslim Bosnian, Bosnian, but it's organized, it's being hosted by two women from Visoko, who I don't have their picture here, unfortunately, but um, a nun and a, and a woman who owns this, who runs this organization, organization, Mosaic. They do this work together. So they brought their two communities together. <coughs> um, let me see, what one do I want to use next? Sabiha. Sabiha I know least. She is a good friend of Zilka's, my co-author. So I don't have so many nice pictures of her. I found this one on, online. She works at Medica Zenica, but I have a lovely story of how she is using and adapting the existing religious and cultural rituals in traditional and traditional ways together. Um, so Sabiha is a theologian, a Muslim theologian. And she was working with women, a lot of women who had been abused or raped during the war and after the war. And many of them came with essentially religious questions and concerns. What do I do with this baby that was conceived out of rape? Is it against my religion to abort it? How will my religious community, very patriarchal religious community, accept my victimhood? For those of you who have done any, have any, any contact with victim work, it's very difficult, in Bosnia at least, that women are who have been raped are not necessarily their victims, but they're also viewed often as somehow the bad people. How do they deal with that fact? Um, how could God allow rape and torture? These kinds of questions. So as a theologian, she began to try to find answers. It was, very, again, a very practical thing. And the male-dominated Islamic community would not discuss these issues, so she was really in a place where she needed to talk with them. And Zilka, also my co-author, was doing the same thing. So she was providing actually what, what we've called contextualized interpretations of Islam. So really looking at what, how do we apply Islam to this situation here now to address the needs of these women and to provide a foundation for their healing and the reconciliation with their families and societies. So I love this example that Sabiha has used. She's a feminist, as you might have picked up from before. Um, so she has used, so there's, these are babies being born from rape. And she would use herself the Muslim naming ritual for a newborn child, something that's usually done by men. And this rite of passage to connect the baby with God, I think it's eight days after, I don't know if you know Aida, I think around eight days after the baby is born. I could be wrong about that. 
um, Sabiha would recite the first call to prayer, the Adhan, in the baby's right ear, and then the second call to prayer in the other ear, before calling the baby by its name. This is a traditional practice in, in, in Bosnia, as I understand it, coming from Islam. And then call the baby by its name three times. And she would do this rather than a man. And she says, the child is then passed from one person to another so that this new human being who belongs to this community can be accepted as a gift from God. That's the general idea of this ritual. Through this ceremony, Sabiha observed an inner change. Emotions rise, and those family members who yesterday were against this baby, who wouldn't accept it, and could not see this <coughs> child as part of their family, suddenly change when, they see, when, when this ritual is happening with this baby. It becomes part of the community because it's being welcomed in this ritual way, which I find quite personally quite powerful. Another example of, um, of using traditional ways and in incorporating religion, Vahidin talks about how, as an imam, he fulfills a traditional Bosnian role as a healer. His methods are not always traditional. Um, for example, he uses cranial sacral therapy, which is something that was introduced by Western, a Western uh, worker, but actually cured him of his shaking. He, was, he said he would go and sit with, as an imam, he would go and sit with people over coffee and listen to them and give counsel if they wanted it. And he couldn't do it because his hands shook so badly that his coffee would always spill. And it really, it seems sort of silly, but it was a really big problem, actually. And then he had the experience of being treated through cranial sacral therapy, which is non-cognitive, it's looking at the, it's working with the nervous system, and he was not completely cured, but he can now hold a cup of coffee. It's not so obvious, and he now has been trained in cranial sacral therapy and passes this on to his community. So, as a healer in this traditional role, using a very non-traditional method, he's able to um, perform some really important, um, yeah, I would call it peace building activism in his community. Um, how much time do I have? Am I at the end? Just under two. Okay. I could, as I said, I could go on with all the different examples. Let me just point out this one because I think this is one of my last slides. In Sanski, most they have initiated, Vahidin and Mavudin have it's taken many, many, many years to initiate this interreligious council. At first, these men did not want to sit together. They expected the other to say, yes, I will come first, and everyone wanted the other to go first. So to actually have them sit at a table was a big deal. It took Vahidin three years. Who are they, sorry? Sorry, we have the, I don't know their names, but okay. the Catholic priest, so Vahidi is on the left, mm -hmm. Catholic priest from San Schimos, the head imam, and the Orthodox priest on the right from this town. So it's a mostly Muslim town, but you have both these other churches. And there's also a Protestant priest or pastor, but I don't know if he's, why well, he's not in this picture, but he's usually participating. <laughs> And over time, I mean, I've watched this, so I, I've spent a summer with Vahidin working with him um, in San Schimos in 2009, before he had any organization really happening, and it was just him. And he was trying desperately to talk these men into just coming and having a meal together or coffee. He couldn't do it. And now, this is a, an established council. They like to meet together, and they, this is one example where they're sitting together and talking to a group of people about the resources of peace within their own traditions which they do regularly now. The, the goal, at least one of Vahidin's goals, is, is to tie Sanskimos to Priyadur, which is the neighbor, kind of the neighbor town in, in Republika Srpska, and that until now hasn't happened, but that's a hope to kind of include both towns. And this is an example, I'm just finishing here now, of, of peace education that I think is important, religious peace education. Amra wrote and published a manual, let me see if I get the exact um, title, a manual on, for, yes, her manual for the teachers of Islamic religion on the peaceful dimensions of Islam, which is specific to Bosnia, so she really uses the Bosnian traditions and the Bosnian history. And she has toured the whole country, actually she got the acceptance of the, relig of the Islamic community to, to train every single one of the more than 900 teachers of of Islam in the public schools with in her book. So she's given all of her, her books out and, and an introduction to how to teach with this method. So this is one I was at, at the Banya Luka Mufti Luk, um, a couple of years ago with the, with the head there. So 
the education is out there, whether it's being used as a question. I, I, maybe you know about the fact that this religious education is being taught in the public schools. It's very controversial. And Amra is trying to deal with the fact, rather than saying this should or shouldn't be there, she's saying if it's there, how can we make this as nonviolent as possible? What can we do to actually alter what's being taught um, through this religious education to show that this peace dimension? And she refers to, for example, her family is long, long history in Sarajevo. One of, I think, her grandmother, grandfather or great grandfather, who stood up for. Um, I'm trying to remember the exact story, but he stood up for another community and said to his own Muslim compatriots, "Look, don't." don't act violently in this case. And so she's bringing in stories from the history to say this is our heritage, we need to, to understand and know this. I'll stop there. Um, if you want to know about any of the other examples, um, I mean, I've been happy to share some stories. The point being that this is a, a field that's not very well known and that I, I personally believe needs to be more, um, to, needs to be strengthened and supported with the obvious um, concern or challenge of how to include such practices in secular situations and in situations where religion is being mobilized for ethnic um, and national causes and, and division. Um, in my opinion, only the religious peace builders, the religious act actors can address these issues within their own faith, so they need to be involved. I'm going to put that out there to you and see what you think and have a discussion about it. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, thank you very much for this wonderful presentation, Julian. And I think you showed us uh, that everywhere in this world there are nice people who do <laughs> nice things. So <laughs> that's always so. good. Um, I think this is a good topic that fits nicely into our ongoing seminar series, which is devoted to the crisis, uh, to Europe's multiple crises and how Southeastern Europe reacts to it. And it does, so, it does fit in this series for two reasons, the first one being of the country that it analyzes, of course. I don't know how many of you in the room have been here last Friday when we had the former president of the European Council, Hermann van Rompuy, speaking, and in one question he was asked about the Western Balkans. And I'm paraphrasing here, but what he said is everything looks looks okay, not as bad as one would think, except for the situation in Bosnia, which is the most problematic in the Western Balkans. So um, I think um, putting Bosnia back on the agenda and creating more understanding and engagement from all of us, not only in the academic community, there has there's been a whole lot written about Bosnia in the academic community, certainly in the political science community, but also from, from the larger public is, is one of the important tasks at the moment, because Bosnia is now undergoing a social, economic and political crisis, and uh, I actually had the benefit of reading your paper, you sent it to me, and there is, at the end, I don't know whether it will stay till the final version in it, <laughs> but the conclusion starts... The two uh, imams that we have seen observed that the situation in Bosnia and Herzegovina on the ground is worse now than previously. The political circumstances are less stable, people speak more about divisions, and there seems less hope for a common future. So this is how you start your conclusion, yeah. which is a rather <coughs> bleak outline, if I may say so. And we will actually have a seminar on precisely that topic in week eight, when we will talk about the legitimacy crisis. So let me use this opportunity to plug that event as well. <laughs> <laughs> and for the second reason why it fits nicely our seminar series is that we are confronted here with a rather important general question that oftentimes leads to crisis, and this is what to do with religion in a post-war context, and in a post-war context in which religion has been actually part of the entire conflict structure. The Bosnian war was by no means caused by, caused by religion, but religion was the single identifying, uh, it was used as a distinction between, uh, to distinguish the free groups. So, so the question is, now we have a peace treaty, so what to do next? And we, we can take the liberal position, which is basically putting up this wall of separation. You've called it secularism, but mm -hmm. I would say it's, it's a profoundly liberal understanding of putting up a religion, uh, uh, putting up a wall of separation between religion and the state, and uh, marginalizing in your terms religion, put it in, 
in the corner of the private, or we can take the communitarian approach and basically say these religious differences are there, these people are religious, they express their religiosity, so we have to accommodate that in, in one way or another through the state system. And then, regardless of how we, depending on how we answer these questions, the larger question is what does this answer entail for our ultimate goal, which is the creation of a stable and democratic society in this particular case. And as you know, I come from the power sharing, sharing political science field, and there's not much power sh sharing scholars agree among themselves. But one thing that they do is, is that it's, it is easier to establish a stable democratic rule in a homogeneous society than one with religious differences. So we tend to see that we tend to understand religious diversity a priori as something bad. And I think this is where your work comes in quite handy, and it shows us that we need to have a new perspective on this, on this whole issue. And we need to question some of our main assumptions in the field of political science when dealing, uh, when dealing with, with, um, with these post-war situations. And you also provide us not only with a or perhaps rather less with a theoretical approach, but a practical one. And we see how it's done in practice. I think it's a very, very valuable and very, very important contribution that, are, that you are giving. Now, having said that, <laughs> uh, let me challenge you on three things. And, and I, as I told you beforehand, I, I, will, I need to make two caveats. The one is I'm a political scientist, so I'm rather interested in the larger picture than these two cases. And the other one that I will be provocative in my, mm -hmm. in my critique, just to get the discussion going. I might not necessarily agree with everything that I'm saying. Oh, devil's advocate. Okay. Yes. <laughs> Let me start by, by your first point. Um, using religion as a peace-building tool. And here I could not help but think of, of the famous uh, quote from Goethe's Faust. In the original German it reads, Die Botschaft höre ich wohl, allein mir fehlt der Glaube. I hear the message, but I lack faith, mm -hmm. or I lack trust in that message. And nobody doubts that religion has a peace, a peace longing core. Nobody doubts that it can lead, it can be understood in a way that promotes religious tolerance, that promotes coexistence, that promotes peace. And in fact, there is this uh, world ethos project of the theologian Hans Küng, who basically travels the, around the world and tries to convince everybody that all religions in the world share a common ethos, a common, common aim to do good. So there are these effects. However, if you click for, on the next slide for me, please. This is one of the cartoons that I found in The Economist. And uh, there are two dogs standing in the middle of a destroyed city, I guess, and one says to the other, it's all, it all started with an argument over whose God was more peace-loving, kind, and forgiving. So this is, if we look at, um, at the evolution of history, the evolution of mankind, if we look at contemporary problems with Daesh, with terrorism, with religious wars, the Crusades, what have you, then as one atheist put it, uh, believing in God is one of the leading causes of death in this world. So, so the problem, I think, is not the potential that every religion has mm -hmm. in promoting peace. It's rather the simple, practical, empirically observable, observable fact that it, does, that it often does not do so. Yeah. So my question is, how do you see the internal connection between religious belief in the individual and, and acts and deeds at a general level? I and mean, are those people truly motivated by religion or are they, are they just nice people who happen to be religious? And in fact, in your paper, you write the following. You say, this paper considers Muslim, not Islamic peace building, because the activity does not originate in Islamic teachings. Rather, these Muslims, Muslim actors utilize their secular training and tools by personally reconciling their work with Islamic faith, principles, inspiration, and otherwise. So I would put to you that what you're talking is not actually, as you say in the subtitle, is not bringing faith into peace practice, but actually channeling mm -hmm. peace-building practice through faith. And this is a completely different, different thing. 
Um, so, or put it in a more political sciencey manner, how does the causality actually work? Mm -hmm. What influences what? And I think that, on a side note, you have actually a distinction here which is quite important. I don't think that your major argument is about these people being led to do good by their religion, but rather their audience is religious. So they have to find a way to interact with their audience, mm -hmm. and for that they use their religious tools. I mean, if you look at how the International Committee of the Red Cross, to name something completely different, I mean, the International Committee of the Red Cross has one major principle. It is everywhere where an armed conflict is going on, they want to promote the Geneva Conve Conventions. And they want to do so even when rebels are fighting the state. So they go to these rebels, and they cannot say to these rebels, you know, you have to abide by the Geneva Conventions because your state signed that treaty, because these people challenge the state. So that's not an argument. Mm -hmm. Rather, what they do, they actually go back into the teachings of the philosophers, of the historians, of their own community, and say that the values that the Geneva Convention includes are present in, in their own tradition. And I think that's what you're... That's, that's what your example. peace builders mm -hmm. also do, I think. And that's, so I would challenge the causality. The era of causality okay. runs probably the other way around. Then my second point goes, goes a bit away from this level of, of the individual. And it, it's something that, that I think we have to distinguish when we're talking about religion in these terms. And it is the distinction between personal faith mm -hmm. and organized religion. And as you, as you said, the problem, as you will hear in the Balkans when you, when you talk about this, they will say the problem is not religion. The problem is politics. And you even said that. You said po uh, re the religious communities have put, not put on a political hat, a nationalist, ethno-national mm -hmm. hat. And you have this, this, this major dis distinction between the Muslim peace builders that act, as you write, independently of the Islamic community. And the Islamic community is kind of the church organization for the Bosnian mm -hmm. Muslim or the mosque organization, I guess. Um, for the, so how to square the circle between the official teachings and political goals of the religious organization and these people that do these good deeds and justify them or motivate them by their religion? You know, that, that is something, so what does your research show? And, and you've mentioned this example of the Serbian priest who, who actually could not get the blessing from his church to engage on this level. And I think that's, that's really important, that we, we need to engage not only on a, on a micro level, but also on a meso level with the religious. Mm -hmm. and, and as is, you know, um, the clergy or these, these religious organizations in Bosnia, they actually mirror the social developments quite well. I mean, um, you ha they are ethno-nationalistic, and I remember when the census data was was um, compiled two two years ago, I think 2013 or three years, three years ago, in all the Islamic communities, you could get a leaflet that told you how to how to identify yourself. That uh, I think it said, uh, my nationality is Bosniak, my faith is Islam, and my yes. my uh, my language is Bosnian. Because those were the two, three crucial questions of the, of the entire census. So these religious organizations would actively campaign. <coughs> and I'm sure the others did well. I, I just did it as well. I, I just didn't see these, these leaflets. So these are the crucial. There is, an intim there is a level of analysis that you kind of miss by looking at these, at these people that are, that are so committed to their work. And this brings me to my third question. And this concerns the question of how, where do we go from here? How do we generalize those findings? Because I'm touched by every single story that you have, that you have uh, explained and also the ones that you have in the paper because for each one of these tents, she has actually examples of, of how they do it. And, and they, are, they, are to, they are really, really examples that, that touch even my cynical soul, you know? So, so my question is, how, what do we learn? How can we apply this into other contexts? So what is, what, what is the, what are the practices that we can export, that we can infer from there? Because you, you say yourself, you mentioned these, build, these peace builders are quite unique bunch of people. Mm -hmm. So there is no general peace, religious peace building or peace building channel through religious on a larger scale. 
Those are individuals that are committed. So, so, and plus you have two from Sansky Most and two from Sarajevo. If I remember, because those oh, are then the Sarajevo. Yeah. Yeah. Sarajevo. Uh, like, ha what do we infer? What are the questions? So okay. I think I'll leave it at that. <laughs> okay.